We are live, everyone. Hello, and this is episode 56 of Get Your Tech On, our show on all things Doxis. I'm Brady Volpe, founder of the Volpe Firm and Nimble This. John Downey's with me today. John is also CMTS technical expert and leader of Cisco Systems. Welcome back, John. Oh, John, I didn't First have you queued <laughs> First time go. caller. <laughs> well, welcome back, John. Good to see you again. So how you been it's doing, John? It's always great to be here. Good, good. Uh, uh, we talked earlier, but a quick plug. Uh, I will be presenting at Anga, Anga, Anga in Germany uh, mid-May. Uh, and I know you and uh, Mia go every single year, so I'm, I'm sure I'll see you there. Uh, and I'm hoping to submit an abstract for SCT Expo next year, or for this year as well. So I know those are coming up. Have you submitted anything yet? Yeah, so I'm also, I'll be presenting at Anga as well, and yeah, Mia will also be there, uh, and I do plan on submitting an abstract this year for SCT Expo. I took the last, I think the last several years off from SCT, so I will submit an abstract this year for that. Um, uh, also coming up, uh, light reading, um, that's the, I think the week of March 16th, I'm going to be talking at uh, light reading in uh, Colorado, so we'll be doing that uh, there as well. So are you going to be nice. attending light reading? Uh, no, no, I'm no plans anyway. Um, we have our own big uh, conference called Cisco Live. It used mm -hmm. to be called Networkers. Yep. And I got my abstract on the power of DAA, distributed access architectures. It's accepted for Vegas in June, first week in June, I believe it is. Uh, so I'll be out there presenting that. And really it's... When you do Cisco Live, it's more Cisco centric, so I can go more in depth. They gave me two hours, so you know I'll fill the two hours. Um, the first for forty-five Anga, minutes will be on your agenda. <laughs> <laughs> and Anga, it's I got fifteen minutes. Yeah. So yeah, you're gonna have tough, you're gonna have a tough minutes. time at Anga. <laughs> <laughs> if I go first, I'll just eat into everybody else's speech. Yeah. <laughs> so. Cattle prod. So yeah. hey, uh, so our topic today is uh, we're gonna talk about Doxis three dot one channel bonding. Um, we had a, a really long question from one of our listeners. Well, it's, I think it's going to take up a large part of the session. It's a pretty, pretty good one. Um, first, I have a couple things to talk about in the news. So um, let's see. First up here is uh, the latest issue of Broadband Library is now out. So um, check that out if you have. And if you don't get the hard copy, uh, so this, you know, this is a feature for all SCTE members. Um, a lot of them get hard copies. If you don't get the hard copy, go to broadbandlibrary.com. Uh, all, all the posts on the front page are all brand new. They just came out. Um, mine's in here. You can check out Evolve or Die. Can Doxis 4.0 compete with Fiber? Um, so just uh, some analysis there, and a uh, lot of good authors. All, all the content on, on Broadband Library, some really good technical content. So some good learning things there. Uh, next I thing up, Ron had, yeah, Ron, Ron had one in there too. Ron has Fiber an article floaters. here. I think his is right, uh, right above or right below mine. His is uh, Understanding Band Splits in Two-Way Networks is Ron's article. Um, so... Yeah, some uh, article here on extended spectrum to 1.2 gigahertz uh, from Nick Segura at uh, Charter. So that's a, also a good article. Um, to go to 1.2? Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely check these out, or, uh, everyone. Or beyond, oh, beyond 1.2. He's talking about probably going to 1.8. Yep, absolutely. Okay. So definitely some good stuff here. Uh, I want to give a shout out to NCTC. And, and for those of you who may not know NCTC, National, uh, National Cable Co-op, um, yeah, I'm going to say NCTC wrong. I better look off on here what it is. NCTC is uh, an organization that really focuses on the smaller cable or independent cable operators. And they put a lot of different things together, a lot of different offerings together. And I, I wanted to recommend everyone take a look at their press releases because they just came out with some nice offerings. Uh, one's an agreement with CCI um, to offer professional services, uh, Cisco support agreements, uh, even Cisco hardware and stuff uh, at discounted right, right, uh, rates for NCTC members. Um, so I think that's a great deal that they put together. Good for CCI for doing that. Uh, they also offered uh, offering a new initiative with Amazon uh, where you can get Fire TV devices um, for your s subscribers. So you know, a, lot of, a lot of independent operators are offering over-the-top stuff right now, and this is a way you can get uh, endpoint devices for your operate operators. 
uh, at a reduced rate. Uh, they also announced an initiative with Tech Int Labs, um, providing digital marketing services for your for your subscribers or your business here. <laughs> and uh, and then they have a, an agreement with Perfect Vision Manufacturing that um, allows you to uh, for for cable operators to get discounts on provide uh, getting. Uh, components and parts and stuff like that that uh, you may need for your operations. So some nice deals here that they've put together. And in addition to all the stuff that they already they already offer, um, so recommend that. And you can also get discounts on uh, P and M products through our uh, one of our partners, Zcorum, uh, if you're an NCTC member. So keep that in mind too if you're looking for P and M. So, don't know if you have any comments on that, John, but uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, with the first one you said all. was yeah, C- CCI is a was has always been a great Cisco partner. Absolutely, so CCI has some really great guys, uh, very intelligent and up to date on Doxis and best practices and recommendations and real world solutions, right? Um, and and uh, I know they have a, their own training facility up in Minnesota. Wisconsin. I know it's cold Somewhere where they're at. There. Yeah. <laughs> Todd uh, Todd Gingrich is uh, from that area, so he's uh, he's a great guy as well. I know a lot of a lot of my customers work with him, so super guy. And his cousin Yuli. Yeah, I haven't met his cousin, but Todd, Todd's a good yeah. guy. So any of you got any any guys out there that are working with Todd, uh, tell him I gave a shout out to him. Uh, the next couple of, of articles that I have in the news just. Uh, just doubling down on 5G because I, I want to keep everyone who's uh, you know who listens to this podcast aware. 5G is definitely a threat. Uh, so Light Reading had has like uh, three articles that they put out recently. Uh, T Mo, uh, the first one's kind of a positive one where T Mobile's saying you know um, uh, 5G may not be fully baked. Uh, however, AT and T and Verizon came in and said, well, no, you know we think it is. So there's you know little disagreements between what Verizon's saying and AT and T. Uh, and, and what DSS is, is is the dynamic sharing spectrum sharing that they're they're using in the five G. So that you know it's kind of like some of the uh, things we've struggled with in in uh, you know full duplex doxes and stuff like that. Uh, but they're 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 having some, or at least T Mobile's having some challenges on the the five G part of that. Uh, then they also talked about uh, it's kind of interesting. Dish is getting into the five G network. They're just doing a little bit in twenty twenty. They're only sp- spending half or uh, yeah, half a billion on it. Um, that's their intro to, to get involved and in, but they're expecting that they're gonna spend a lot more afterwards. Um, and then finally Sprint. Uh, so you know this merger between Sprint and T Mobile is ha- I think that's been approved now, but now Sprint is also investing uh, into their five G market to get in there as well. And they're and they're offering really pr- pretty, you know, Decent plans, um, eighty dollars per month uh, to get five G access at un- what they call their unlimited premium plan. So you get fast speeds, unlimited data, and and so it's kind of interesting to see this that they're offering that because their you know their goal is to compete directly against wired connections. So those are those are the articles uh, that I I found pretty interesting. Um, yeah, five G starting to compete back pack directly with us and. Um, and they're trying to do it in, in a pretty, pretty aggressive way. So have you heard anything uh, on your end of the woods for 5G and how it's competing or if we're doing a good job in competing back, John? I mean, it's a big buzzword for a while now, right? Uh, and time will tell. Um, you know, the whole idea of 5G was how do we get out to the rural areas or but it turns out it's probably cheaper, you know, to hit the people that are really um, condensed. <laughs> uh, so I can do smaller cell sites. But from my realm, I'm looking more at, you know, mobile backhaul over Doxus. How can I use maybe existing cable plant that a cable company put out there and do small micro cells or small, small cells for 5G? Uh, the question will come up is, is am I deploying a technology that could displace myself <laughs> am i creating competition where i don't want competition or can i work with it and you can make the analogy of when over the top video first came out it's like you can fight it uh, or you can get on board just like you said evolve or die <laughs> you know so we you need to figure out how to op- and it always comes down to uh quality of service customer care relationships 
Um, and people just uh, appreciate that more, regardless of just technology. And then it comes down to not just speed, but uh, availability, not right. going down. I can tell you firsthand, I had HughesNet 5G, you know, their 5G meant fifth generation. Didn't meet five gigahertz <laughs> or five gigabit per second or whatever. It, it was their own. Um, but it was a metered service. So I'd hit 30 gigabytes and it would slow down tremendously. And I could hit 30 gigabytes in two days if I really yeah. wanted to. Uh, you know, my, my latency was so bad. It, everyone on this podcast knows, right? The latency was so bad. I would talk and then you look at my mouth and it'd be three seconds before stuff would catch up. And the complaints were unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they were. <laughs> yeah. So but, hey, some news on our side. I don't know if you saw it. Uh, did you go? You were at SCT Expo, and you, yeah. did you go to ATX's booth? Yes, yes. They I were did. the ones showing the Gap Node. Yep. Generic access platform. Mm -hmm. uh, ATX has been heavy and hard into the uh, Gap and uh, generic access platform and making the housing, uh, and we're working with them on the modules that would go into this housing. I said this is like 20 years late, but uh, <laughs> we want to make a generic node housing that would do FTX, Doxus 4.0, Remote Fi, Remote Mac Fi, uh, you name it, whatever it needs to do. Um, I think we announced that uh, ATX uh, will be doing their, or they announced that they'll be doing their own modules that work in our game makers. Because we announced that we're getting out of the hardware, right? We got rid of CPE, Technicolor took that over years ago, a few years back. Uh, we're still going to be doing our nodes, but Cisco is moving more towards software, licensing, uh, cloud. Uh, as far as hardware, amplifiers, taps, all that, that's all been announced to be going away. Uh, as far as I know, the amplifiers, ATX said, I think they're going to make modules that would fit into existing game maker housings or oh, nice. the nodes that... Yeah, the SA Cisco nodes or, or amplifiers. Well, I'd imagine they do that with other nodes as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Yep. But I'm, I'm sure there's always been licensing agreements or trademarks or, you know, so you always have to uh, make it legal. Yeah. So I think ATX is taking it, which makes sense. So ATX is already working on a generic access platform. So uh, I guess they're going to start uh, supporting amplifier modules and stuff going forward. So hopefully, you know, if we talk to ATX, we can convince them to make the 1.8 gigahertz stuff and maybe different Diplex filter solutions. And um, like you said, it just keep evolving. You know, <laughs> we keep use evolving. their hardware expertise now. So excellent. They, they picked up some Cisco guys too. Yeah. I think they picked up some Cisco guys. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, so uh, I got, we got to get to the chat room here before we get on to our main question here. But uh, so Brian Wilson. Brian, thanks for listening. Uh, he says, what's the maximum number of bonded channels a DOCSIS 3.1 modem can support? And uh, we did get a response from Daria, uh, Dari Marza, a good friend of mine. Hey, Dari, thanks for listening. Uh, he says 32 by 2, um, but I think we can do 32 by 8, right, on a uh, DOCSIS 3.1. Just SC QAM, standard QAM channels. Correct. So for single carrier QAM, uh, legacy channels, if you will, 32 by 8. Um, but I always tell people it's 34 by 10 because <laughs> yeah. it's 32 by eight on single carrier qualm and a two by two for Doxus 3.1. So 32 so by 1 10? In the market. So technically 34 by 10. 34 by 10. Okay. Yeah. Cause you add two channels for OFDM mm -hmm. and two channels for OFDMA. Okay. So basically you have a 32 by eight and a two by two. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Rick Yuzi commented, he said, uh, the availability of CPRS uh, mid-band spectrum will make it even more of a threat because, uh, and I think this goes back to our 5G conversation, will make it even more of a threat because of that being a sweet spot between uh, range and penetration and speed. That's interesting. What, uh, what is the frequency band of that? Uh, I don't does, know. Does, we'll it, have to... does it actually break it down? I don't know. Maybe uh, Rick knows more about that than us. Uh, I'm not. I'm not actually and, and, that familiar with it. So yeah, I tell you what. I I need to get more. This is part of my even my career aspirations to dive deeper into 5G because I do think it's going to be disruptive technology, and or complementary, competitive and complementary. 
So I need to get further into it because I can even tell you my wife, she's reading all this stuff about conspiracies about 5G, smart meters, frequencies causing cancer. <laughs> uh, you know, I can't that believe that, that, that either you <laughs> or your wife would be into conspiracy theories, John. <laughs> Maybe just I just body don't believe it. Keep telling us. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, so it's uh, Rick, like I, I need to. I Rick's need to saying find more about CBRS is on the is in the three point five gigahertz range. So three point five gigahertz. Yeah, that reminds me of the old uh, 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 the the Chinese eight hundred two dot eleven blah 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 where uh, our microwave and our Wi Fi has always been two point four gigahertz or five gigahertz, right? And there was always a three point five gigahertz that was usable, I think, in China. And I don't think we've ever used it here. I thought it was used by Sprint at one time. Um, but if we're opening that up for 5G, you know, you and I know as RF guys, the higher the frequency you go, the less distance you can travel because of the median you're going mm -hmm. through. Yep. Medium. Attenuation um, gets you down. Get more attenuation, right? I hate attenuation. So, <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so you would think if 5G is smaller cell sites, shorter distance, it's much higher frequency. If it's a much higher frequency, the question is higher frequency means a smaller wavelength. Yep. Smaller wavelength means it can penetrate certain things, whatever, but higher frequency means it has more attenuation. So there's always that trade off. So, yeah, I need to find out more about this 3.45 gigahertz uh, if how far it extends the typical 5G stuff. I mean, you saw speed numbers, speed numbers, they're touting what? Over 100 megabit per second, maybe even more than that. Uh, through Wi-Fi or through uh, mobile. By the way, I'm 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 leaning towards saying mobile versus wireless, because people are using that terminology the same. Yeah, I guess they'll. But when I say wireless, I think that's like Wi-Fi. Wi and yeah, yeah, and mobile is the so, this this handheld long devices. yeah the handheld <laughs> spectrum. Yeah, Dari says this used to be unlicensed or used to be licensed spectrum that they're using, and now it's unlicensed spectrum. And he he he's also redeeming himself. He's he's coming back and saying thirty two qualms he and plus two OFDMAs in the upstream is what he meant, not not two two SE qualms. So <laughs> Dari's a very sharp doxis guy. I've worked with him for years. So back back Dari and I met back in the uh, when I was doing the doxis protocol analyzers. Uh, so he was he was helping me sell those oh, years wow. and years. Long time SigTech. Yeah, SigTech. Back in the SigTech times. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, let's get on to this long question we have here. I'm gonna I'm gonna read through the question and then we're gonna break it up into parts. Uh, starting with the first part where we, we're talking about BOD here, but this comes in from Michael, and he says I've been looking for some guidance on upstream channel bonding for Doxis 3.1. He said, with differences in BOD rates, we'll get back to BOD rates and sharing of time slots. Would it would should we be bonding the 3.0 and 3.1 modems on the upstream? It's the first part. My question is around the idea that if we do not bond, uh, the 3.0 modems would get access to all the time slots and not be waiting on 3.1 users. Additionally, how do the different baud rates inter interact with bonded? My understanding is that OFDM uses longer symbol rate which means a lower baud rate. If we allow the 3.0 to run without bonding, is it actually faster than it is when bonded? Almost twice the rate, or is it the rate 2x, the OFDM rate, and this works fine? Especially if we let SC, SC Qualm and OFDM run independently and allow two users to send concurrently rather than waiting on each other. With timing and baud rates, Bod differences, are we better off allowing two upstreams to run independently and not bond them? And he says, I have a similar question on the downstream. Should OFDM and SE qualms be bonded? And, and it kind of all goes down to there. So, so we're starting off talking about SE qualms and OFDMs being bonded in the upstream, OFDMA being bond, bonded in the upstream, and and you know, basically the the rates, the bit rates being Different. And the re reason I'm saying bit rates is he's talking about baud rates. And I, and I actually wanted to stop about baud rates because I think that would have been a great topic even for um, l the last episode that we had with Ron on because we do get confused a little bit about baud rates and, and bit per second. The, the difference being um, 
baud baud rate kind of came from when we had just you know serial modems and the the modem would go from um one one basically transmission to another and and if you said you know my my baud rate was 1200 baud that meant you had 1200 bit per second but now that we have higher order modulation rates uh, for example, 64 QAM or 256 QAM, um, that has eight different levels that we can transmit different on, or that we can transmit data on. So, if we had uh, 9600 baud, that doesn't mean we have 9600 bit per second. We would actually have, um, or I'm sorry, if we had 1200 baud with eight, eight, eight different levels, say two to the eighth. We'd actually have 9,600 bit per second, even though we had 1,200 baud, because you take 1,200 baud times eight bits per baud. Is it two to the eighth? So, so, so let me simplify it. Let me simplify. You got a simpler it. explanation a, for it. One of me? the first papers I ever did was when I was at Secor Electronics. Yeah. One I did on powering, right, and surge suppression and all that. The second one I did was, uh, um, I think it was at Cisco, or maybe it was WaveTech. I can't remember. I did a uh, understanding digital. What is digital? Uh, and I call it bits, bytes, and baud. What yes. is a bit? What is a byte? What is a baud? And and actually, baud. If you say baud rate, that might be redundant because I think baud actually indicates includes the rate in it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think baud rate is it's, the real it's just word. Baud. It's just baud. Yeah. But to me, the simplest way of saying baud is really megahertz. What is you're taking an analog signal and manipulating phase and amplitude to represent digital data. Right. We're not doing baseband digital as ones and zeros on and off, but we're taking an analog signal, manipulated by frequency or amplitude to represent ones and zeros. Well, baud is really talking about how wide is that channel? Like you just talked about 1200 baud. Well, maybe that was 1200 uh, hertz. And I manipulate that in phase and amplitude to give me eight different symbols. Um, uh, one that's 180 degrees out of phase, that would be 180 degrees out of phase would be BPSK, by phase shift king. Uh, 90 degrees out of phase would be QPSK, quadrature phase shift king. So I could manipulate the phase, but then I can also manipulate the amplitude, which is giving us qualm, right? Quadrature amplitude modulation. We manipulate the phase and the amplitude. Um, to me, if I say baud, I'm thinking how wide is it in megahertz spectrum? Right. And then if I look at the modulation I'm running, I can take that modulation and say two to what power equals that modulation. So if I say 256 qualm, well, two to the eighth power is 256. Right. So that's eight bits, eight bits for every one of those symbols. So if I have uh, a 192 megahertz wide DOCSIS 3.1 with one megahertz guard band on both sides, that's really 190 megahertz. I take that, if it's all active subcarriers, and I would multiply it by eight bits for every one of those symbols. Mm -hmm. And that could give me the bits per second, right? Uh, so yeah, you can run the math different ways and you know there's overhead and blah, blah, blah. But to me, baud is megahertz. And it's, it's the occupied rate. bandwidth almost that you have. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, that's the easy thing. So so if we say, um, he's talking about upstream, right? Docs 3 went upstream. To me, more is better. But I can understand some. More is always better. <laughs> yeah, more, bigger is better. More is better. Uh, you know, why relegate someone to smaller channels when they can occupy or utilize more? Mm -hmm. So if I can take, like, for instance, if I have a 3 0 modem and he does four channel upstream bonding, or he can do DOCS 2 0 mode, which is better? Well, obviously, four channel bonding. Yep. If I do four channel bonding, I spread the data over four channels. That alleviates the need for load balance on the upstream because he basically spread his load across all the whole whole upstream spectrum. And it's not uh, so bigger is better. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, yeah, exactly. You know, that channel isn't bouncing around, around um, when when it does become overloaded. If you're up to your point, if you're so and, and for everyone's edification, if you're operating in what like John's saying, Docs is two O mode that modem will not do channel bonding. It'll sit on one upstream channel. If the capacity on that channel gets full, the CMTS will move that Doxus 2, that, that modem operating in Doxus 2 mode 
to a different upstream channel where we're not bonding. It, it can't take advantage of using both channels at the same time. It doesn't even have an awareness that both channels exist unless the CMTS tells it to move. So a DOCSIS 3.0 modem or even a DOCSIS 3.1 modem can operate in DOCSIS 2.0 mode, in which case it says, I, I don't know that there's more than one upstream channel. I'll just use one upstream channel at a time. And I guess that's so that, sort of the concept and, and here. The first part of the yeah, question that, is, should we do channel bonding in the upstream or not? Yes. So here is a big reason why, and, and I think his question really is, should I bother cross-bonding between 3.0 and 3.1? Mm-hmm. If 3.1 already allows a big upstream channel, um, it's very a lot of subcarriers, right? But let's suppose I do a 48 megahertz wide upstream OFDMA. Does it buy me anything to cross-bond that with four ATDMAs? That one is iffy. If you're trying to hit certain peak speeds, you can hit a pretty decent speed with the 48 megahertz OFDMA by itself. If you cross bond with four ATDMA all at 64 qualm, you're adding an aggregate of 108 megabits per second more. So you could look at the numbers and say, if the OFDMA can give me 500 and the four ATDMA gives me 100 more, that's 25% more. Is it worth it? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, do I want the 3.1 modems to eat up my 3.0 spectrum? Do I want the 3.1 modems to starve out my 2.0 modems? Um, there's going to be an inflection point is sort of what I'm getting at. You're going to have to cross bond the OFDMA and the single carrier quantum to get a certain peak speed. If you want to offer 100 mega on the upstream, you're going to need 150 to 200 megabit aggregate speed to offer the 100 meg service. And you're going to have to cross bond the OFDMA with the ATDMA. Just to you, you need more you need more capacity in order to give that hundred megabit per second tier if that's what you're trying to offer to your point Correct. right and, Correct. and the so OFDMA no alone doesn't give it so you so you have to add in the SE qualms to give you more than a hundred megabit per second as a as a pipe Correct. in the upstream. But now, here's what I would recommend. Well, hold, hold on, I have, so, a, I have a follow up question here for you. <laughs> it, let's say you're not, you know, you're you're not trying to give 100 meg per second. You're only giving 50 meg or maybe 25 meg per second, and you're still facing this cross bonding issue. What is the max scheduler, the brains in the CMTS? What's it going to tell the modem, the DOCSIS 3.1 modem, to use first? Is it going to say, hey, use that OFDMA band first to send your data, as provided that it's not fully utilized? Or is it going to use both the OFDMA channel and the SC QAM channel, which I, I think this is part of Michael's question, which is then going to take capacity away from the DOCSIS 3.0 modems? So it would be CMTS vendor specific, how they implement their queuing and their upstream schedulers. Remember, every upstream channel has its own upstream scheduling. So it can be scheduled simultaneously. I think part of the question alluded to like serially allocating spectrum to the upstream channels. Well, I can allocate on both upstream channels at the same time. They're independent upstream channels. Um, but back to your point, I'm happy to report that Cisco, <laughs> <laughs> we allocate many slots on the 3.1 spectrum before we start eating into the 3.0. And, and that's what I would expect. That, that's what I would yes. expect that, and I hope all vendors do that. And and well, this would yes. be my recommendations because if I, if I, if I were an operator putting three one modems out there, and I know I have legacy, I, uh, probably a lot of legacy three O modems. That, you know, initially the majority of my plants going to be three O modems. I would hope those three O modems get access to the the eight TDMA SC QAM channels first, and the three O three one modems stay on their OFDMA band because I wouldn't want them eating into my SC QAM channels. Mm-hmm. Uh, Agreed. I, I, those that's limited bandwidth that I have for my 3.0 modems. Initially, I'm going to have a lot of 3.0 modems and very few 3.1 modems. So keep my 3.1 modems off my SC QAM channels that my 3.0 modems are using. Correct. So that that's what happens on the downstream as well. So when you cross bond the downstream OFDM with single carrier QAM downstreams, uh, the 3.1 modem will use up the OFDMA OFDM before it starts using up the single carrier qualms, which okay. is what you would want, right? And you, you said that's on a downstream. Um, that That's the same way yes. it works. So, yep. And then on the upstream as well. So we definitely schedule the 3.1 modem on the 3.1 spectrum 
before we start scheduling on the 3 O spectrum or channel, if you will. Okay. So I think we're um, answering the, well uh, the end part of Michael's questions about should we be bonding SEQAM and OFDM on the downstream, right? Because to your point, we'll, uh, the, the DOCSIS 3.1 modem, at least if it's a Cisco CMTS, the DOCSIS 3.1 modem is going to use just the OFDM on the downstream before it even starts utilizing any SEQAM, correct? Correct, correct. Right. So back to the upstream, the big advantage of cross bonding, even if you like your example, you said I don't need a super high speed, but uh, I have some three one modems out there. I'm trialing out three ones. I'm going to activate some three one spectrums, my OFDMA, um, but I don't have a lot of three one modems out there, and I'm not offering a really high speed. Should I cross bond? To me, yes, you should. And as the 2.0 and 3.0 modems go through attrition, you should start getting rid of ATDMA channels and opening up more OFDMA, right? So say you have start with four ATDMA and a little block of OFDMA. As the 2.0, 3.0 goes away, you start pulling back the ATDMA and open up the OFDMA. It's more efficient, more speed. The reason why I like cross-bonding OFDMA with at least one single carrier qualm is redundancy. You're building in your own partial mode redundancy and resiliency because every upstream channel has station maintenance. If you push the 3-1 modem to one single upstream channel and it went down, it won't go to partial Modem's mode. Down. It would just go offline. Yep. Yeah. So I think having at least two upstream channels, regardless if it's 2 OFDMA or 1 OFDMA and one single carry qualm, even if that single carry qualm is not 6.4, Make it 1.6 if you're really scared about a spectrum. But giving that one more upstream channel gives it a T4 multiplier of two, so the modem stays online longer, and it gives it one extra channel for station maintenance in case something happens with the OFDMA. Right. So so it gives me a lot more advantages by having at least one single carrier qualm cross-bonded with my OFDMA on the upstream. Okay. Makes sense. sense. And... and um... Remind us again what because I, I have a, I have a, Vili ask what's the download speed limit of a single 200 megahertz OFDM channel with 4K QAM, which um, I I believe that's 1.89 gigabit per second uh, for yeah, good, good good way to way to quote a good number there <laughs> yeah <it's>, but <laughs> so I was going to ask if you, you optimize yeah it, and it's not 200 right it's 192 192 if you guard bands the cyclic yeah. prefix and you get rid of one megahertz on both ends for guard band you get rid of your pilots your scattered pilots all your overhead um you end up with about close to 1.9 gig, assuming 25 kilohertz subcarrier spacing. Yeah. If you do 50 kilohertz, because it's less subcarriers and the overhead becomes more of a higher percentage, you end up with maybe 1.7 or somewhere around there. Yeah. And, and what is it on the upstream for a, uh, a uh, 90 or 92? two megahertz carrier 90, 96 so we 96, support 96 think, yeah. megahertz but there's a half megahertz on both sides of guard band that's not uh adjustable so really out of 96 you can get uh, 98 megahertz of ofdma uh 20, assuming 25 kilohertz some carrier spacing what modulation you want to do <laughs> what modulation do you think is going to work well i mean 1024 is what the spec says so no, ten, spec says 4k qualm in the upstream, I thought it was only 1024. I didn't think they went up to four. Nope. They go up to four. Did, nope. they, uh, did they modify yeah. the spec now to go to 4K? No, it's it's always been there uh, for upstream, but yeah. most modems would never even try it because yeah. they think it's just a literally a pipe dream, <laughs> pun intended. <right? laughs> um, but we've gotten 2K and 4K qualm to work on the upstream. In the lab. With a remote, remote phi, no amplifiers, no plus zero. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So... Um, but assuming 1K qualm, uh, 1.5, I have 0. 0.7, 700 megabits per second, I think. Yeah. I'm just thinking out loud. We have a calculator that will actually throw in all the numbers and figure out the overhead, and, and it'll tell us the, the estimated speeds. Yeah, the number I've been going with was 500 megabits per second, but I I, I didn't know that. The, I didn't think it was going up to 700. And, and was that a full 96 megahertz wide channel? Is it 96 megahertz wide? It may have been a 50 kilohertz spacing, subcarrier spacing yeah. for the... Uh, yeah. For the ch- yep, uh, that'll eat up. Yep. That'll eat up some overhead. 
So either way, I mean, we can add more speed. The question is, why are we adding more speed? If you're going to add more spectrum, more channels, more cost for license, it's usually to hit higher peak speeds, yeah. not because you want more people sharing it. You know, it's not because of an aggregate pipe. You actually are doing it to hi hit higher peak speeds. Yeah. Trying to offer, you know, 500 meg on the upstream, maybe yeah. one and gig eventually. Yeah, and Vili, you're you're so welcome. Thanks for thanks for watching. Hope I pronounced your name right. Um, <laughs> so, uh, okay, so back to this this question we're in here. Is, I think we've covered uh, the bonding aspect. Uh, we're talking about the bit. So, uh, part of the question here: how you know how do the different baud rates? Right, I think we can go to bit rates um, interact mm -hmm. when bonding. Um, so, you know, I think this would be, this is probably CMTS specific on, on how it's handled. Yeah, it's um, scheduling, right? Yeah. It's and like I scheduling. mentioned, I alluded to it's every upstreams, its own independent channel. The downstream sends maps for every upstream. So they're independently scheduled. Um, so that's not like one is waiting for the other to get done. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at the flow and modem makes a request for bandwidth and let's suppose the modem's allowed to concatenate three 15 18 byte ethernet frames so that's about 4500 bytes the cmts will know it can't handle that 4500 bytes so it'll fragment it then the cmts on the downstream map will tell the modem hey i'm going to give you 200 mini slots to send this fragment and then i'm going to give you 200 more mini slots maybe on a different upstream channel to send the other fragment and then i'm going to give you 150 mini slots on the other channel to do the other fragment so now the CMTS has granted the modem multiple bandwidth requests or grants on multiple upstreams all at the same time. Because, you know, if you look at Spectrum Analyzer, you'll see the upstreams all pop up at the same time. They're, it's mm -hmm. not like one after the other after the other. Uh, so they're all independently scheduled. The CMTS can take those queues and offer them up on the downstream maps for different modems, different sizes. I, I, I'm trying to figure out how deep he's trying to get with that question you know is it a queuing thing is it a concatenation thing i, I i'm not really sure <laughs> is he trying to set me up for failure <laughs> <laughs> yeah insecurities creep in all the time don't they <laughs> no, yeah that, I, I was trying to explain this to motive here I was trying to explain this to someone the other day on the downstream that we have a bunch of bonded channels in a downstream because they were worried about the primary channel. I said, you know, it just, it looks, when you're sending a bunch of data on the downstream, it, the CMTS kind of looks at it as one big pipe and it just stripes that data across the downstream. So I, the upstream is really quite similar. You know, it's it, from when you're dealing with just subscriber and data, not looking, not taking into account. Uh, the you know range responses station maintenance and stuff like that these channels just look like a big pipe from the standpoint of scheduling and sending that data down and you know not not to get too hung up on each individual channel unless you're dealing with impairments or something like that and so i would uh, let me let, let me throw a hypothetical at you which might tie in with uh, his second question about taking this cross bond to downstream side of it do you feel like i'm, I'm always going to promote cross bonding uh to a point um, as the OFDM gets bigger, let's suppose you go to two OFDM blocks. At that point, there's so much 3.1 spectrum just for 3.1 modems. Why eat into the 3.0 spectrum? Like eventually you might go from 32 single carrier qualms down to 24 and start limiting them down to 20 or just for your legacy modems, just for some 2.0, some set-top box, some 3.0 modems. But if you're offering 500 meg or one gig speed, you're giving a customer a three one modem. Yeah, you're not giving them a three zero modem. <laughs> yeah. So well, you, you you'd better, be better be. off pushing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how it works, but <laughs> but so here's a hypothetical question for you, and and I'll tell you where I'm leaning. Should you make the OFDM primary? Should you mean you so it doesn't ever even look at the SC qualms? Should, I mean, the, the SC qualms are still going to be primary, but should you even make the OFDM primary capable? So you, oh, you, are you saying so the uh, the OFDM is only a secondary channel and is only sending data and you get your Correct. you get all your telemetry data from the SC qualms? Yeah, yeah. The, the, yep, the primary information to keep the modem online. When it registers, it comes online. It's locked onto a primary. 
I mean, we support primary capability on OFTM now. Right. But the modem will only range, even a DOCSIS 3.1 modem will only then range and register on the SC QAM channels. No. What I'm saying is now you can make it range on the OFTM. Right. Because if you make it a primary, it can do that. Unless I thought you were um, saying, should we should we make the OFDMs only secondary? So it, it doesn't range. That's what I'm it. asking you. That's what I'm asking you. Well, I, it's a hypothetical situation. I, I, I guess initially I would say I, I wouldn't do that until we get uh, a large enough mass of 3.1 modems. As long as we have 3.0 modems out there that are, uh, lar- I mean, totally dependent on those SC qualms, and, and, and there's still a large majority of 3.0 modems, um, I, I would say no, we want to keep the 3.1 modems ranging on the SC qualm channel, or I'm sorry, on the OFDM channel. And keep them just completely dedicated. That keep them off the SC qualms altogether. That that would be my initial well, thought right now. So, so here's the argument I can make uh, in my own head. Uh, you can make the argument that OFDM has a PLC that's 16 qualm. It's very robust. You can place the PLC where you want it. I know where you're going. Um, the, the, so uh, OFDM is probably more robust in regards to primary keeping it online. Then say a single carrier qualm that can only go, you know, 256 qualm and that's it. But it also depends on what spectrum you're talking about, right? So you can make an argument that if I make the OFDM primary and 3.1 modem locks on the OFDM, OFDM as primary, maybe it'll never go offline. Yeah. Maybe it won't go down. But what I think we should do is stick with the single carrier qualm. They're going to be primary anyway to support 3.0 and 2.0 modems and don't make the OFDM primary on purpose. And the reason why I say that is resiliency, because yeah. when a secondary only channel reports a CM status message of uncorrectable fact, qualm unlock, there's a bunch of CM status messages from the modem, then the CMTS can put the modem in partial mode. Mm-hmm. But if that modem is using the OFDM as a primary, it's not going to report any of those same status messages because it only reports them for secondary only channels. Yeah. So, and what if something takes out the PL, you know, something lands on the PLC and the OFDM channel goes down? Do you still have yeah, the you qualms to follow, rely yeah. fall back on? So, um, uh, Antarpreet, uh, I, I probably am messing up your name. I'm so sorry. Uh, but uh, mentioned reliability with OFDM. Um, so I think that's where you were going with it was uh, reliability or yeah yeah and so, and people seem to be putting the the three oh three one downstream at the high end so it yeah. could have high end roll off it could have uncorrectable effect granted three one is more robust in the fact that it does graceful profile management mm-hmm. so once the modem comes online on the data profile which is some people call profile A uh, it might be as low as two fifty six qualm. And it, I, the modem starts reporting back MER readings of all the subcarriers. The CMTS can put it at higher modulation, but yep. the modem has to register first, usually 256 qualm, and then the CMTS can say, "Ah, oh, you're a candidate for 4K qualm, or you're a candidate for 1K qualm, or whatever." And that seems to work really well, even without using uh, SDN or external applications at this point. So as we learn more about uh, the graceful profile management and existing cable plants and and the spectrum people are using, and node plus two, node plus zero, uh, we are getting a lot of cases where 4K qualm can work yep. you know, with some best practices and stuff like that. I wanted to go back on the upstream scheduling because you mentioned about on the upstream of a 3.1 modem is using OFDMA and single carrier qualm. I would expect the CMTS to schedule OFDMA first before it schedules many slots on the single carrier qualm, and it does. But here is a kicker for you that you might not know. <laughs> and, and, and as an RF guy, you're going to appreciate this. It's not like the OFDMA is scheduled as one big chunk. It schedules it in chunks of mini slots. And usually a mini slot is about 400 kilohertz of subcarriers, which could be eight subcarriers or 16 subcarriers. Mm-hmm. And that is scheduled on the CMTS from left to right in spectrum. Okay. So, so it starts occupying the left portion of the OFDM spectrum before the, and it does it start, it starts filling it up in chunks from left to right. Yeah. 
So yes. if the if the far right side of the spectrum is in a deep roll off band, and and there's not a lot of users, nobody knows. It's not going to be impacted, Correct. right? But I'm thinking more like people will want to use the OFDMA for five to forty two megahertz, and they're like, oh, can I use five to fifteen now? Yeah. <laughs> Think about and your that. five to fifteen Think is going to be in that. the noisiest part of the spectrum. And that's where we're going to schedule do, first. You should do from right to left then. I I, I would argue or we middle out. Have either... Exactly. Yeah. Go from middle <laughs> middle like. out because the, the high yeah. end is going to be near the diplex filter. The low end is going to be in a noise. Use the middle first. Like like an offset or a user configurable offset. Like say, don't schedule left to right. Still still schedule left to right, but with an offset of so many megahertz, so the customer can say, oh, I want to start scheduling at 15 megahertz and then wrap around if i need it yeah, yeah. but that's just me <laughs> so now is so, that um is that vendor dependent also is i i, I didn't see anything so. in the spec that talked yeah. about yeah. where you start yeah, filling in how yeah where you start and how you schedule it and stuff like that i'm just telling you that's how we do it today which is really leading me to not suggest 5 to 15. you know if you want to open up that spectrum yeah, we could do lower modulation schemes, and we have and modulation schemes on the upstream are called IUCs. We start out with IUC 13, which is normally like uh, 64 qualm, and then we could make a mixed modulation where 5 to 15 is 16 qualm, and then 15 to 20 or whatever is 64 qualm. So we can do weird stuff like that, but knowing that the CMTS schedules left to right. It's like you're wasting time on the wire by scheduling a lower modulation. Absolutely. Yeah. You know? That's an so opportunity for improvement, there. man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's a trade-off there that I'm like, if you already have set-top boxes, like I have a customer with Davic and some telemetry down there from from like 8, 9, 10 megahertz, they're like, oh, yeah, but I can open up from 5 to 8. From 5 to 8? What the hell are you going to do with 5 to 8? Yeah, <laughs> you know, not just much. don't even bother with it. You know, <laughs> just maybe start your OFDMA higher up, and then the question is: Do I put the OFDMA up to forty or forty-two, whatever, or do I do the ATDMA on this side and OFDMA on the other side, or do I swap them? Mm-hmm. What it, to me, I want to give three one a better chance of running higher modulation if I can. Right, which is not going to be five to eight. <laughs> no. <laughs> 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 not at all. Not at all. I want to give it the best spectrum I can so I can run higher modulation because 3.0 can't run higher modulation. Yeah. You know, 64 qualm is the highest it can do. Um, all right. So I think we've answered most of these questions except for one part here. I'm just going to read it to you and uh, we'll see. We'll see what we've done. It says if we allow the 3.0 modems to run without bonding, is it actually faster than it is when bonded? Almost twice the rate or is it the 2x? of the OFDM rate, and this works fine, especially if we let the SC qualm and OFDM run independently and allow two users to send concurrently rather than waiting on each other. So I I think this goes back to where we're saying it's it's when you bond two channels, it's it's one big pipe. If you have single channels, yeah. um, you're you're gonna be stuck on that single channel that if it's if there's heavy so utilization we give on that an channel. Example. That's it. Let's say it's two channels. You and I are, have a channel piece. Yep. The problem is we both only have a certain peak rate. Mm-hmm. We have individual channels, and we're both getting 10 that, megabits per second. You said nine? But I said 10. 10. Yeah, okay. It, so it, each channel has yeah. a max peak rate of 10 megs, megabits per second by themselves. No, well, actually, if it's single carrier qualm, 27 megabits per second, right? It depends on what qualm, modulation you're using. That's yeah. assuming 64, 64 qualm modulation qualm, in the upstream. So it's 27 megapiece. But I'm saying, uh, let's suppose our QOS, our CM files, is 10 megabits per second. Mm-hmm. So for the sake of argument, let's say 27. So, you so 27, when you're saying QOS, that in the config file that gets loaded into the modem by the operator, they say this subscriber gets a maximum upstream rate of yeah. 10 megabits per second. Correct, correct. So, and so let's change that back around. Let's say it's unlimited, 27 a piece. Okay. When you look at per modem upstream speed because of DOCS's request grant cycle, there's a lot of variables that come into play. You'll probably never get line rate. You'll probably, a single modem will never get line rate, the whole pipe. And this is what we call overhead. Which is overhead. why we also, 
Yeah. Well, not just overhead, the fact that you're doing requests, grant, request, grant, oh, the piggy, how much yeah. concatenation, how much fragmentation, how many mini slots. Uh, there's a lot of variables that come into play. The actual distance away affects yeah. the map advance. So that's why we also, you know, lean people towards saying the aggregate pipe should be twice as big as what you're offering. Okay. So if the pipe is 27, you shouldn't offer more than, say, 15. Mm -hmm. So let's suppose both of us can get 15 megabits per second on individual channels, but we can't get higher than that. Right. But if we bond the two and we both share the bigger pipe, you have better stat muxing, better statistical. It's a bigger pipe. Yeah. I know it's individual channels, but we are both sharing those two channels. So I'm yeah. not waiting on you. You're not waiting on me. Um, so we both can hit peak speeds uh, much easier than if we're both doing individual channels. And if an individual channel goes down, I have to load balance across or move across and re-register. So we Whereas bond to two, two channels, channels, and now our pipe, instead of being 27 megabits per second, is 48 megabits 54. per second. 50, 54. 54. Oh, 54, yeah. I never was too good at math. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for keeping me honest. I was to be an engineer, now I are one. <laughs> I are. I are. I was educated well. <laughs> so. So, um, so, so the bigger pipe, obviously, is better. Individual channels, individual scheduling. You're not waiting on the other guy. So I sort of see that scenario, what he's getting at. Uh, but with that said, more speed does not mean less latency. Right. Right? That's the whole thing behind low latency. Latency is it, yeah. I was just say low latency, that's a different that's a different podcast we've had. <laughs> low latency docs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so I can you you mentioned like downstream. If if I I bond four downstream channels, I get a bigger pipe. I, down, I bond eight downstream channels, even bigger pipe. So I can tell you from, from uh, history and from experience that I had voice problems when I went eight channel bonding. Latency. Yep. You have a bigger pipe, you have faster speed, but you have to re-sequence -sequ re all the packets that are going in these downstreams. You think about a voice frame on the downstream, a voice flow is only about 110 kilobits per second. You're taking that voice flow, very, very small, and spreading it like 12 kilobit per second on each downstream channel. Now, I thought there was a feature, That's well, why. now to your point, if- but we don't so, do that. So that, we recommend don't do that. Not even for for operator managed voice for for voice over I mean for for voice operator <laughs> for voice over IP if it's managed by the operator you're no longer putting that over one channel. So so I recommend oh correct we don't by default uh, it's a bonded flow and that downstream flow would get bonded. Hey, it gets striped across channels. all downstream and yes. all upstream channels now. So from experience when I went from four downstream bonding to eight downstream bonding, it got worse. Ah. I had voice quality issues. So by recommendation, we came up with a global config to say, don't bond the voice. Right. So we know what a voice call is. We look at the UGS flow. We have a low latency Q flow in the downstream that coincides with the UGS upstream flow. Uh, we know it's a voice flow uh, and we put it down the primary downstream. Okay. Which that right there could also lead me back to don't do a primary OFTM. Right. If I'm using that command to put the voice down the primary, and that primary now is a 3-1 primary, I'm not sure if that voice is going to work the same way yep. as if when it was running down the uh, single carrier column primary. Yeah, but it, but absolutely none of this applies when you're using regular over-the-top voice services, services like Skype, what we're doing right now, uh, um, that, that, FaceTime, you know, what every pretty much most people are going to. Yeah. That gets striped across yeah. everything. And so you really yeah, need to make yeah. sure your whole plant yeah. is good. All downstreams, all yeah, upstreams even, are good. Even on the upstream. You know, on the upstream, uh, VoIP, voice over IP, EMTA, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the stuff you pay for, DQOS, dynamic quality service, the voice call gets set up dynamically. Uh, it is put into a UGS flow, which is unsolicited grant service. It is assigned a single channel upstream so that we can guarantee jitter and, and latency. Yeah. Yeah. See, I thought we that's what happened with, with, uh, uh, on the upstream managed voice services that it did get bonded on a downstream and upstream, but <laughs> any other voice or video service you're doing over the top is, has, yeah, has no yeah. quality of service on it. So. Correct. So that would be interesting with bondage is if I start doing four channel or even more upstream bonding, will it get worse? 
because yeah. it's a best effort voice flow and it could be scheduled one packet at 20 milliseconds could be on upstream one another packet at 20 milliseconds could be on upstream four uh and then the end device has to resequence them in order could upstream bonding be detrimental to so, bondage so, so this might be the one case to michael's question where the less bonding, the better <laughs> for voice. Yeah, yes, yes. In, in this case, for for a, f- a slow flow like voice, that's not really voice. It's still a best effort flow. Yeah. Skype, bondage. All right. To make matters worse, to make matters worse, UGS means unsolicited grants. Unsolicited means you're not asking for them. Yeah. So there's not any request, grant, request, grant, request, grant. It's request, set up a call, grant, 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 grant. That's UGS. Vonage in Skype is request grant, request grant, request grant, request grant, request grant. It's the worst. Every it's, 20 milliseconds. It still yeah. works, though. <laughs> and all those requests are contention requests. Yeah. So if they have a contention with somebody else that happens to be coming online, you're going to lose that packet. Yeah, you get a little breakup. Yeah. <laughs> well, John, we killed another hour. It's amazing. On one yeah. question. That is a good question. A lot of good topics <laughs> there. So, Michael, appreciate that question. Um, John. Thanks again for your time. For all our listeners, thanks for listening. Uh, another great episode. Our next episode is episode 57 on March 27th at 2 p.m. on plant balancing. John, I, I hope you uh, you uh, signed up for that. You're available for that. Um, <laughs> when was it? March 27th? March 27th at 2 p.m. We have a lot of topics on uh, plant balancing, and I think you'll be perfect for that, John. Um, so we do our best to bring this good content every month to our listeners. Uh if you like us, you know, please subscribe, hit the bell button so you get notifications for our episodes. If you listen to us on podcasts, subscribe on your favorite podcast. Um, thanks so much for being here. We'll catch you on March 27th, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, John. All right. Take care.